Hello, and um, welcome to the second part of uh, our module four, which is interceptive orthodontics. We have reviewed the development of the primary and permanent dentition. Now we are going to see how to improve the orthodontic outcome of our patients. My name is Dr. Jean-Marc Retrouvet. To discuss the most common orthodontic problems found in young patients, present different modalities of treatment, and identify the proper timing of treatment. So in this lecture, topics to be addressed are first, dental crowding, second, eruption problems, third, posterior crossbites, fourth, increased overjets, and fifth, anterior crossbite, and sixth, oral habits. So let's start with dental crowding. We are going to look into space maintenance. We already have looked into eruption patterns. So now we'll see what is the abnormal dental crowding situations that we can solve or help during the mixed dentition. We're obviously going to look at the control of the leeway space, which is a very important aspect of interceptive orthodontics. Look at dental extractions, mainly of primary teeth to help alleviate crowding and initiate orthodontic treatment. So the first aspect of interceptive orthodontics is space maintenance, an often neglected aspect of mixed dentition orthodontic management. So as you can see on this image, this patient has lost the second left lower primary molar prematurely. So it is an important treatment option to add a space maintainer, in this case a unilateral space maintainer, to ensure that the first permanent molar will remain in its position until the second premolar can erupt and then we will be able to remove the space maintainer and either discontinue treatment or move on to a second phase of treatment. So, why do we maintain space? Well, the first indication is to allow for an optimal dental alignment to take advantage of all the space available. If the patient has too much space, then maybe dental alignment may not be. So, why maintain space? Well, the first indication is to allow for optimal dental alignment. This will allow the permanent teeth to erupt into their normal position and will conserve an acceptable occlusion and will not let also the lower molar, as in this case, to tip mesially, which will result in a unfavorable occlusal pattern on the left side of the patient's uh, occlusion and will actually decrease the amount of orthodontics that will be necessary to resolve the malocclusion. So an important aspect is, yes, we are going to maintain the space. So the occlusion is very, has to be taken into account because an, a loss of a lower tooth also has implication on the alignment of the upper teeth. We also use bilateral space maintenance, such as lingual arches. Again, one of the appliances of choice in the mixed dentition as they serve a great purpose. The lower incisors have, in this case, the lower incisors have resorbed five primary teeth, which has resulted in a midline shift to the right, a loss of space on the distal of the lateral incisor, and now we have no, not enough space for the permanent canine to erupt, but the leeway space is still present. So I like to do this kind of space maintenance 
I usually use the lower second primary molars as anchors because at this age, especially at seven years of age, the lower first molars are oftentimes not eruptive enough and are very difficult to bend. So my first choice on a young patient is to use the second primary molar, make fabricate a lingual holding arch, and add a little hook, as you can see here, to hold the dentition into position. The goal is not to resolve the malocclusion. The goal, the goals, I should say, are to maintain the teeth into their proper position and also not let the low incisors to supra erupt by placing the lingual arch on the lingual aspect of the lateral and lower incisors. On the upper arch, you can also use this appliance, as in this case. Now the patient is in full braces, as you can see, but this appliance, which is called a Nance appliance, it's a holding arch, about the same as a lower lingual holding arch, has an acrylic button, will hold the molars into position and let the dentition mesial to the molars a, the opportunity to align without mesial migration of the upper molars. So that's a very useful appliance also when you lose primary teeth prematurely and you want to maintain the position of the molars. The problem that you have with the, these appliances, by the way, is it they tend to negate or reduce the amount of natural lateral expansion of the upper jaw. So you have to be careful not to leave these appliances for too long. The second aspect of the space management uh, concept, especially on the lower arch, will be the control of the leeway space, as we've discussed in the preceding lectures. It's probably one of the most important aspects of interceptive orthodontics because it will allow you to reduce the number of premolar extractions that will be necessary to do if you have good control of this natural space that is actually located, as we said before, under the second primary molars. As you can see here, this is the first permanent molar. This is a primary canine, and you can see the distance is the same between the mesial of the primary canine and the mesial of the permanent canine, but there is a huge space difference between the second primary molar and the second premolar, resulting in a hidden space that you can use to your advantage to alleviate uh, lower incisor crowding. And you can really appreciate the difference in size between the second primary molar and the second premolar. So if, if you do nothing, as we said before, this molar will most probably shift into the space and negate any possibility of alleviating lower incisor crowding. On the other hand, if you can maintain the leeway space and use it to your advantage, the, primary, the, the, the first premolar will drift into the space, follow the canine, and then you will be able to alleviate up to five millimeters of crowding on the lower arch just by using this important uh, this space that is very important for space conservation. Second advantage, you will not procline the lower incisors, which actually should be resulting into a more stable result as the teeth are going to stay within the normal arch shape that was naturally created. Dr. Granelli, in the landmark article, has looked at leeway space control and has concluded that 75% of orthodontic cases could be treated without extractions 
and without procognition of low incisors if you could maintain the leeway space with a simple lingual arch or any other method interceptive orthodontic concept and not waiting for all the adult teeth to be present in the mouth because if you wait for all the adult teeth to be present in the mouth then you will be losing the leeway space so please um, really ensure that you follow your patients from the age of eight until the age of 14 and take advantage of this leeway space as you will reduce the number of extractions or the need to procline the lower incisors uh, labially to align the dentition. So you can see here in this case of a panorex taken, we had on the upper right, there is some resorption of the primary canine root. There is lack of space right here, but mainly for us, this is the upper arch. But most important is exactly what I just saying, on the lower arch, we have had some loss of space. And now those three permanent teeth will have to fit under these two molars. And it, in some cases, people will call for serial extraction, which means extracting the first primary molar to let the uh, premolar erupt. And then you end up by premolar extraction. That's one solution. The second solution we adopted in this case was just leeway space control and monitoring. The patient also had a maxillary upper rapid palatal expander. So you can see now, once we finish the rapid palatal expansion, there seems to be more space for the canines on the upper arch. The lingual arch is in position. It's doing nothing in a sense that it's just a passive appliance. And you can already see that the premolars and canines are slowly erupt erupting. There are still rotations of the premolars, but the space seems to be sufficient now to let the premolars and canines erupt in a proper position. After a year, the upper left canine is still not totally properly positioned, but you can see that the lower arch now is maybe not perfectly aligned, but all the teeth are in position. And if the patient is not by maxillary protrusive, this case becomes a non-extraction case. And all we used in the interceptive phase of treatment was a rapid palatal expander on the upper arch, followed by the low, lower lingual arch. So as you can see, it works in some cases. Obviously, this doesn't negate all extraction cases caused by bimaxial protrusions or severe crowding. But in case of moderate crowding, this procedure is very helpful in reducing the amount of needed extractions of premolars. Something else you can do, too, which was published by Dr. Mauro Cosani in 1994, which is, again, a procedure that's not used extensively, but I do have a few dentists in my practice that help me out with this procedure is the reduction of the second deciduous molars. Um, what it is, it's an out of the way to take advantage of the leeway space. Again, as you can see in this case, that was published in the JCO 1994, which I... So what happens is it's another way to take advantage of the leeway space. As you can see, there is some crowding here. There is some rotations there of the lower left lateral incisor. It's a case of moderate crowding, okay? You could also argue that we can extract the lower canines, let these teeth position themselves, and place the lingual arch. That's one way to do it. Another way would be to do a serial extraction procedure. But if the patient has nice facial features, it's kind of hard to justify to extract four premolars for such a small amount of crowding. This, the third solution is just to procline the teeth when all the inside the permanent teeth are present. It's a very simple and efficient procedure. What are the indications? Well, as I said, moderate crowding on the lower arch. If it's too severe and extractions are necessary, then this is not a procedure you want to do. As I said before, we should do a case. You've lost the deciduous cuspid on one side. You have four millimeters of crowding. That would be a solution that I would definitely consider 
to realign the midline and ensure that the lower teeth get into good position. Obviously, timing is very important because we're going to reduce the size of the lower second primary molars. We want to ensure that it will be a comfortable procedure for the patient and we will not get into unnecessary dental treatment. I always wait until there is total, almost total resorption of the roots of the deciduous second molars. In this case, obviously, you have crowding. You can see this lower primary canine has been lost, so the teeth are straight, but canted to the right, and also the midline is also shifted to the right. This would be probably a good case for a molar reduction. The problem is the patient is just too young. You cannot reduce at this age because one, it'd be too sensitive and it would be too early because the first primary molar is still there and would be basically useless. So you have to wait. You cannot do the molar reduction at this age. This is the perfect timing, especially for the lower right-hand side. This is when you really want to start doing this reduction, as you can see here. This tooth now is almost fully resorbed. It's not sensitive anymore. You can remove two millimeters of mesial material right here. So you let a little bit of extra space for the premolar to erupt. By doing this procedure, the first molar will not advance or not tip into the uh, to the mesial. So you leave a good space maintainer, a natural space maintainer, this what will happen, this premolar will actually drift into the space. This canine can drift, and then you can yourself reposition the lower incisors without proclination. This would be a little bit late, but it's still acceptable. Please look at the little horns here, right there. This is the perfect time. This was before treatment. There was the only, what Dr. Kozani did is actually remove those teeth, which he doesn't, we do not, we're not doing this anymore. What we basically do, we wait for them, for them to exfoliate. And if they exfoliate on time, then we do the reduction, two millimeters of reduction at the mesial right here and right here. What happens, the premolar will drift into the, the space. And then what is the most important for me, in this case is, as you can see, this tooth was able to tip labially. It's not fully tipped, but now it becomes a fairly easy case to just, with braces or a small appliance, to just push the tooth into position. But the most important result was this tooth was actually rotated by itself and now will be much more stable throughout the life of the patient because it was a natural rotation and a natural repositioning and you can see there's still, there's still a tiny piece of space left that we can use. So this case now becomes obviously a non-extraction case and is a very simple case to handle. This, by doing a very simple procedure, you made the orthodontic treatment a lot more simple, but mainly a lot more stable.